unfortunately, President Fenton isn't with us this evening. He's on an official junket to Germany, arranging some... ...summer divisions, and they're giving us a year's supply of Pilsner. <laughs> Incidentally, <clears throat> excuse me, in order to be here this evening, I flew all the way from Los Angeles at my own expense. <laughs> now, if Washington, the Press Correspondents Association, wants to do something about it, that's up to them. <laughs> I'm not going to mention it again. <laughs> Neither will my lawyer. <laughs> But before I leave tonight, I would like to have the names of all of you who are here, so at least I can deduct it. <laughs> but, but as long as I'm here talking to you correspondents tonight, I would like to say that I feel that four years is not enough for a president's term. It should it should be at least 10 years, because then he could try to fulfill all the wonderful promises that he made. <laughs> and incidentally, I un Hey, fellas, I'm not through yet. <laughs> and incidentally, I understand that the FBI has solved the problem of all the airplane hijacking. They're gonna run my picture, the horn blows at the night. <laughs> when? Okay, minutes ago. Are you sure he's dead? The president, the speaker of the house, a couple of secret service men. The building collapsed. Someone will have to get hold of the vice president, have him brought right to the White We've House. We've already done that, sir. And there's a transatlantic phone call waiting for you from Ambassador Juin in Frankfurt. Well, then we'd better get started immediately. Somebody's going to have to make an announcement on me. This will be over with in just a moment. As usual, there's quite a number of candidates. I know of six, for example, who are already building the log cabins they were born in. <laughs> This is the White House, Captain. The Secretary of State here. We're all ready. All right, sir. I have ambassadors win here. Ah, uh, sir? The cabinet is all here, George. First of all, we have to have your confirmation. I'm having difficulty hearing you, Arthur. Please repeat. George, we have to have your official confirmation. You got it. The President, the Speaker of the House, and 50 other people. <laughs> Yes, George, you're coming through. It was the Alta Mainzer Palace here in Frankfurt. The building is 500 years old. It just collapsed. He's glad he's I can't come. believe it. I what about the vice president? I think they can't accept it. How is he? Very well, George. Now, the vice president and Chief Justice Williams are on their way here. We'll have the swearing in within the hour. What do you want done here? Just a brief official statement. Vice president. Is it true? President has assumed is he dead? The office. Yes, both he and the speaker. Perhaps down. some word to the effect that though the man has died, the the office continues uh, passing on the torch, that sort of thing. Good night, George, and God bless you. And God help us, all of us. Good evening, sir. I'm to be the president. Just on an interim basis, Mr. President, to fill the rest of the term. Uh, I've been ill, you know. I've been quite ill. I had a stroke. You were aware of that. Yes, sir, but we're, we assume that you're capable and competent. Neither one, and you know it. In addition, I am medically unable to discharge the powers and duties of the presidency of the United States. What am I but an ornament? I represent 103 electoral votes. I'm a plurality. Mr. Calvin. Don't con me now, Mr. Secretary of State. I'm much too old, and it's too late in the day. May I have some water? Smith, at the moment, Noah, you are to be the next president of the United States. Will you proceed, please, Edward? Yes, I'll need a Bible, Mrs. Bloor. Well, there's one right here, sir. You'll need more than that. What you need, gentlemen, is a man. I am not he. I'm sick, and I'm dying. Oh, Noah, give it a chance. Give the office a chance to assert itself. You've been waiting all your life. Mr. Calvin, you have a constitutional obligation. In eight to ten weeks, you'll be burying another president. We can survive campaigns. 
That's the system. I don't think we can handle that many presidential funerals. I think we'd best get on with it. That you are. Uh, Shall I call in the press, sir? I think we'll redo it for them later. Just give me the Bible. I'm not the man, Senator. That's right. You're the next in line, huh? Oh, I'm the Secretary of State, yes, but I'm not the successor. President, Vice President, Secretary of State, Matt Warner. That's not the case anymore. Is it, Edward? The Succession Act of 1947 states that the order of succession is President, Vice President, Speaker of the House, President pro tempore of the Senate. Who? The President pro tempore of the Senate. That's Douglas Tillman. Hello. Yes, this is Douglas Dillman speaking. Sleep, Mr. President. There's nothing more that can be done tonight. The funeral arrangements? Yes, that's all being taken care of. The president's wife, the president's widow, has been notified. She was at their home in Phoenix. She's being looked after. And uh, tomorrow's schedule? Jim Talley and I are going over that now. You'll have an agenda on your desk when you come to work in the morning. I am deeply at dead in the street. Hmm? We'll make it, sir. Somehow, we'll all survive. And the country will survive, too. Good night. Good night, Mr. President. You believe that? What? That we're going to, uh... Pull it off, muddle through. As I know about six states of these United States that it might consider seceding from the Union by tomorrow lunch. I doubt it. Shock, disbelief, no anger for a while, Senator. We'll all be too busy watching funeral processions on television. By the time they finish weeping for him, he won't be president. Just the same. The White House doesn't seem near wide enough for me tonight.
Perhaps by tomorrow morning I can get my hands to st stop shaking. I'm the wrong one, Wanda. Why? They were expecting a black messiah. You can tell them what they got, eh? What they've got is a black president. That's more than they've ever gotten. May I remind you, not by election? And the rest of the country is going to want an Uncle Tom. Well, I can't be what everybody wants me to be. And I'm a little afraid that I'm going to cause this country more chaos than it really deserves. Well, I don't give a damn about the rest of this country. Their sensitivities, their racial hang-ups. Do me a favor, will you please? Stop being the pedantic professor with an aversion to causes. Stop being Senator Ineffectual. There are 15 million people out there tied to you by the color of your skin. And if you go under, they drown with you. Now, they don't want you humble. They don't want you apologetic. They just want you president. By the way, uh, just what does the president's daughter do? I mean, does she have any duties? Uh, you can uh, guide the Girl Scouts through the Smithsonian, and uh, you can hide Easter eggs on the front lawn. And you can come in here on occasion and help sweep up the broken glass. Get a good night's sleep if you can. I'll take those, miss. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir. How many of the... How many are you? In every room except the bathroom, Mr. President. But I suggest you check behind the shower curtain, just in case. Well, I've been a widower some time. I'm quite used to living alone. Not anymore, Mr. President. Call me if you need me for anything. Good night, sir. Good night. Uh, Mr. President. <laughs> Stephen, is Mrs. Eaton awake? Yes, sir. I believe she had breakfast a few minutes ago. If she's in there. Have you had breakfast? I had a few gallons of coffee and a chicken sandwich around 3 a.m. Shall I have some main? Oh, I would like a little vodka in the rest of your orange juice, please. Have you had enough of that? 
Enough catastrophe, if that's what you mean. <laughs> Douglas Dillman is the president. That should be sufficiently catastrophic for everyone. I'm sure we'll all survive. It's just a matter of keeping him out of trouble. <laughs> keeping him out of trouble. Of such is the stuff of presidents. We had very little choice in the matter. Didn't you? There is a law of succession, you know. Other considerations, personal ones notwithstanding. Mine, you mean. Well, your ambitions, my dear, are hardly secrets in a CIA vault. Nor is the fact that they happen to be for you. Then let's have a moratorium. Hmm? Maybe just a little modest mourning. What did you expect? From you? A sound truck up on the hill making hourly announcements that your husband was aced out of the presidency by an act of Congress. Without my admittedly overpowering ambition offer, where do you suppose you'd be? Oh, third secretary in the State Department somewhere. In a little cubicle next to the men's room. You could have fought for the presidency last night. You could have fought for it, and you could have had it. I'm going to shave and then go directly back to the White House. I doubt that I'll be home for dinner. Oh, well, of course, you must be desperately needed. Oh, I watched you on television. Oh, there you were, my dear, handing him the Bible like some sort of gentleman's gentleman. What's left to do now? Give him a shine and a shave? It's a pity you weren't born a man. You'd very likely be president. The pity is that I married to a man whose principal accomplishment to date is to be kingmaker to a jigaboo. And as to my not having been born a man, that apparently is a misfortune that we both share. sooner or later. It's no monument over them to walk around blowing your nose. <laughs> well, it, it, it's just that... It's just that I was with President Fenton for over 25 years. I was with him for 30. Early this morning before I went to sleep, I cried like a baby. New day, Ma. Let's go back to work. Morning. Morning. You didn't sleep? About 38 minutes. How about you? No such luck. By Friday, maybe I can get to bed. What about uh, Dillman? Oh, he's on his way over now. There's a memo there from Steve Helms. He wants to know about setting up a, a news conference for Dillman. After the funeral. He thinks that Dillman ought to make some kind of public appearance. Press secretaries are always trying to set up public appearances. Holmes is no different. Well, he suggests a TV appearance tonight, you know, something short to put the country at ease. Exposure is the last thing in the world that Dillman needs now. For the next 48 hours, we're going to have to, well, give out some quotes, I guess. Terse one-liners having to do with uh, the fact that the government is not disrupted. We're doing business as usual. We're going to have to do it, you know, Jim. We're going to have to feed him out on a string, gradually. Maybe we can set up some sort of a... Lunch about the cabinet. There's a meeting arranged this afternoon for all hands to be there. That'll have to be postponed until after the funeral. I do not want him handling a cabinet meeting now. 
And when he does, I want to be right at his elbow holding a gag. Absolutely, Mr. President. Haven't you ever heard of a power behind the throne? How far behind? I think that one night and two protracted days are long enough for one sitting, Mr. President. Now, I have asked the members of the cabinet to come in separately starting tomorrow morning. They will brief you in their own areas. I have limited the ambassadorial appointments to a few courtesy calls. We can get to them as quickly as possible. Funeral arrangements. Oh, oh yes. Now, I'm having protocol fill you in on that. You'll be flying to Phoenix on Air Force One. Fly back the same evening. That happens the day after tomorrow. Can either of you gentlemen add to that? Mm. Oh, by the way, Senator, before I forget, the uh, Minorities Rehabilitation Bill, that's due out of committee at the end of the week. What's your reading on that, Miss Senate? I don't know. I can get it pushed through as a kind of floral offering to the late president. That was his pet project, you know. But don't expect much enthusiasm on my part. My support will be delivered in somewhat muted tone. Hey, is that about it? I think so. We can hold the China Treaty in advance until McGraw gets back from the CETO conference, and then with any luck, we can have a table till after the month of January. Well, gentlemen, I think that's just about it. <clears throat> um, the Minorities Rehabilitation Bill uh, what about it, Mr. President? I am very much, uh, <clears throat> I am very much in favor of its passage. So, what in some sort of a presidential statement? This is a Mary Blunt. See, this legislation is black legislation. It addresses itself to a black problem. Now, if it comes from a black president, on the day of the vote, you're going to find yourself with more page boys and senators in attendance, and your bill will die of loneliness. I mean, no disrespect in anything I'm saying, sir. I wouldn't worry about disrespect, Senator. For the past six hours, I've felt like an invisible man, so anything said to me at this point would be refreshing. <laughs> naturally, naturally, Mr. President, we welcome your views at, at any time. Yes, I appreciate that. Well, gentlemen, I have a feeling that I'll be getting a, a good rest while I'm living in this building. <laughs> it's just that if you can get off on, on, on the right... I think platform. we ought to be very honest with each other. Huh? You know, last year, when the majority leaders caucus to uh, choose a new president pro tem for the Senate, we chose you as a kind of gesture. I think you realize that, sir. 
We'd had a year of race riots and protest marches and boycotts, and a lot of people were getting killed. So what you were at the time was a well-dressed rebuttal to the militants. And I must confess that what we'd like to find in you is a lot of discretion, quiet, and a lot of non-controversy. <laughs> For your Jefferson Davis attitude, Senator, I can find very little in you to cheer, but for your honesty, that much I can admire. Well, thank you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> well, good night, Mr. President. I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you, Mr. President. I believe we accomplished a good deal. Good night, sir. Anything else, sir? I think not. See you tomorrow. I'll be here with the morning milk. Good night, Mr. President. Good night. When did this happen? We got it about an hour ago. Attempted assassination of South African Republic Defense Minister by an unidentified... By person. an American citizen, of all things, with a hand grenade. What about the victim? Vanderbilt. He's the head of the yes, party. Yes, I, I know his name, ma'am. What condition is he in? Uh, apparently just a scratch. What a shame. A perfect all-around racist. He must have ducked. You know, tyrants have an instinct for that kind of thing. Hey, can I use that? And move a presidential statement? Oh, we'll have to give this to Arthur Heath. He'll probably give you some kind of diplomatic, uh, regrettable statement to the effect that... Diplomatically regrettable statement for what? Oh, I wouldn't sweat it, Mr. President. There's a bit of a brouhaha in South Africa, an assassination attempt. They claimed by an American citizen, Mr. President, a college kid. Jumped on Vanderwalk's car, threw the grenade, disappeared in the crowd. That's the South African version. Was he identified? Not by, uh, not by name, sir but he was a black kid. The Secretary of State can handle it, Mr. President. I have no doubt. Is there a precedent for this sort of thing, Mr. Talley? I don't know what you mean, sir. If he comes back here, what'll happen? Well, I, well, I frankly don't know, sir. Um, I do know that the Justice Department and the State Department will handle it long before it reaches your desk. Oh, I'm so relieved. God help us if I should have to come up with a decision of my own. What I meant, sir. I know what you meant. You are the press secretary, are you not, Mr. Oh, yes, Adams? sir. Yes, I am. And I think you can paraphrase uh, a sort of a quote as my first official utterance. Say that, uh, say that I think the Washington senators have a very good chance of winding up in the first division. And I like their pitching. Sorry, Mr. President. Mrs. Blore, I thought you'd gone home. Just some odds and ends. I thought you'd gone to bed, Mr. President. I was cleaning off my desk. You were with President Fenton for some time. 25 years. A fair lifetime. I hope you plan to stay on. You're much needed. I hope so. Count on it. What a glorious feeling that must be. We could invoke the Railroad Act, but that does not address itself to the real problem. President Fenton told me personally that he had received an assurance from the BLE that they would not walk out this year. Then I don't think we should hold still for it. I think it calls for some sort of presidential uh, directive. Nothing public, of course, but something to the effect The only that, uh, problem that is in transportation, uh, we cannot depend upon the word of BLE. They do not keep their commitments. What about the promise to the president? It seems to me, Fred, the thing for you to do is that Yes. Get your BLE man. All right, I'll talk to the appointment secretary right now. And ask him this. 
Does that commission hold Did you set up a meeting with some Congress people for this afternoon? Uh, that was tentative, pending this cabinet meeting. What, what's it about? Well, it... Oh, excuse me, Mr. Secretary. There seems to be a mix-up of appointments. Excuse me. I suggest we call a 15-minute break. Right That's a good idea. What was that about? A group of black congressmen. I gather more of a courtesy call than anything else. Well, you'd better watch that. Tell them that the cabinet meeting went on much longer than we expected. I could see them for a few moments now. I wouldn't advise it, Mr. President. What with this bloody South African thing, we want to play down everything racial that we can. Yes, well, I think I should see them now, Mr. Eaton. Very well. In your office, then. And, uh, Jim, you be there, will you? All right. That won't be necessary. I would prefer that someone were with you, Mr. President, unless, of course, you feel very strongly about this. Outside this room, Mr. Eaton, perhaps the illusion of independence. I'm sorry. This press conference for tomorrow, Jim, now what idiot dreamed that up? Oh, Steve Helm told me that the press has agreed to softball him. Dillman, my Pratt, they'll softball him. They'll carve him up and pin him to the wallpaper. We're in trouble. The minorities' rehabilitation bill, this South African thing, they'll leave him with his feet so firmly embedded in his mouth, he'll need a shoehorn to do any talking. We don't know the agenda of the cabinet meeting today, Mr. President, but we had hoped that this latest legislative item would get lost in the shuffle. It's our idea, Mr. President, that we nail this thing right there on the floor, not sending it to committee or any place else, but open it up for a full discussion. And very soon, gentlemen, I'm told by the majority leader that the uh, passage of the minorities' rehabilitation bill is practically assured. We're not talking about the minorities' rehabilitation bill, Mr. President. We're talking about the Watson bill. The Watson bill? I'm afraid, uh, I'm afraid that one eludes me. Perhaps you'd best bring me up to date. Senator Watson's bill proposes that the president be prohibited from firing any cabinet member without the express approval of Congress. Which is another way of making damn certain that you don't step out of line. Or out of place. Naturally, we assumed that, that the bill had been brought to your attention. We also assume that you will publicly call it what it is, an affront. I'll, um... I'll take a look at it. I want to thank you, gentlemen, for bringing this to my attention. We were discussing the possibility of a strike by the Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers. We were discussing the possibility of a strike by the Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers. Can you table that for a moment, Mr. Eaton? I've just been given to understand that Senator Watson is planning to introduce a bill on the floor of the Senate next week. To prohibit the president from firing any cabinet member without the express approval of Congress. You gentlemen know about that? Any of you? Well, Mr. President. Odds are, Mr. President, that that bill will be sent directly to committee. And I doubt very seriously whether it will come up for a vote in either house while, uh, well, while you're still in office. Therefore, it seems to me that any discussion of it at this time is totally irrelevant. That bill is aimed at me, Mr. Eaton, like a harpoon. Considering what little weight I bring to bear on this body, it's like trying to shoot down a fly with heavy artillery. All things considered, Mr. Eaton, it is my presence here that's irrelevant. Mr. President, the press conference, sir, they're waiting for you. And Mr. Eaton suggested you browsed over this also. And he wanted to make sure you'd read his other notes. Oh, I've read his notes by the hour. He writes voluminous marginal commentary. Now I see he's even asterisked all those questions he'd prefer I not answer. Hmm? He's done everything but supplied me with the gestures and facial expressions. Well, I, I'm sure, Mr. Eaton. Well, that is, I think I know what he had in mind, sir. It Don't was only... Don't be embarrassed, Mrs. Bloor. I understand Secretary of State Eaton's function. And I understand mine. 
The way I want him is tactful, discreet, and non-controversial. And I expect all three. No reason. I think the president is on his way now. If you'll take your seats, the press conference will be beginning in a few minutes. Mr. President, if I could have about 15 seconds of your time. What's that? Makeup, sir. Wouldn't help. All right, gentlemen. I'm at your disposal, and ladies. Mr. President. Mr. President. Mr. Pierce. It is Mr. Pierce, isn't it? It's the New York Times, Mr. President. The Minorities Rehabilitation Bill that's just come out of committee, there's been some pressure to table it. Your view on that, Mr. President. The bill in question is a sizable step towards social progress in this country. It has my support. When it reaches my desk, I'll sign it. What if it's tabled? Pardon? What if it's tabled? I don't anticipate that happening. Yes. Haley, Mr. President, San Francisco Chronicle. Uh, Senator Watson has introduced legislation it requires consent of Congress before a president can fire a cabinet member. What's your comment on that? I have no comment. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Mr. President, I'm Amanda Smelker, uh, Midwest Newspaper Association. Yes, Mrs. Smelker. Um, only one of our presidents have been unmarried. That was James Buchanan, our 15th president. And, of course, uh, uh, some have married in the White House after they uh, took office. That's a very interesting answer, Mrs. Smelker. Now, how about your question? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are, of course, a widower, and I was wondering if it had crossed your mind to enter the state of matrimony uh, during your term of office, and if the answer is affirmative, could you tell us specifically who you had in mind? You may quote me, Mrs. Smelker. I should like very much at some time to remarry. I have no one in mind, but if you have someone, we can remain after this conference, and uh, we can jot down a list of names. <laughs> Mr. President? Yes. Gilbert, Mr. President, Chicago Tribune. The South Africans, as of yesterday afternoon, claim we have knowledge of the whereabouts of an American citizen who attempted to assassinate the South uh, African... Alleged, Mr. Gilbert. An American who's alleged to have attempted to assassinate the South African Minister of Defense, Mr. Vanderbilt. My question, Mr. President, is do we actually know where this American is? And if he is in the United States, is it your intention to hand him over? Mr. President, forgive me, sir. Mr. President... Do you have all of the questions and all of the answers on that paper there? First of all, you haven't identified yourself. My name is Webson, Mr. President. I represent the Negro Press International. I apologize to Mr. Gilbert for interfering with his questioning. But what I'd like to know is, is this a press conference? Or is it just a prepared news handout spoken out loud? Any of my responses displease you, Mr. Uh? Well, I'm not here to get pleased, Mr. President. But I am here to hear what the President of the United States has to say about the issue. Pollution bill, pact with the Chinese, the minorities' rehabilitation legislation, and is there the possibility of a black kid being sent back to the lily-white South African Republic to get lynched? Well, uh, forgive me, sir, but we want to hear responses to the question. Your responses, Mr. President not some committee notes that have been fed to you before we were invited in here. Mr. Webson, some two weeks ago, I made a public statement concerning the South African situation. At that time, I said that any move toward extradition would not come by an executive order, but would be handled by the State Department the situation called for it by the Justice Department. Mr. President, an identical statement came from Secretary of State Eden. I would like to hear from you, Mr. President, how you feel about it. Well, 
that, Mr. Webson. No notes, no cues, hints, or preset suggestions. Now, what is it you have on your mind? The ambassador of the South African Republic claims that you'd make it your business to prevent extradition of a black American simply because he is black. I said publicly two weeks ago that I would serve in a consultative capacity if the question of extradition came up. The South Africans also made a public statement that the word consultative was a euphemism. Yes, I read their statement. But you didn't publicly comment on it. Well, I'll publicly comment on it now. According to the South Africans, they have just jailed several hundred people for the violation of their Sabotage Act, their Suppression of Communism Act, and their Unlawful Organization Act. Under the umbrella of this sizable security apparatus, they now hold something in the neighborhood of 1,000 people, most of them black, most of them held incommunicado, and they have repeatedly assured us this is not barbarism, this is simply discipline. So in the matter of euphemisms, Mr. Webson, I bow to the South Africans. Mr. President, Mr. President, Mr. President perhaps I can clarify that somewhat for the members what of the press. What I just press. said, Mr. Eaton, doesn't require any clarification. Now, Mr. Webson and everyone else, write this down verbatim, if you will. The respective colors of the victim and his alleged assailant are a matter of indifference to me. I can assure you that if the intended victim had been a Nigerian ambassador, three shades blacker than I am, and his assailant, the Grand Dragon of the Ku Klux Klan, I would still direct the Justice Department to examine all the facts before we arbitrarily throw an American citizen into jeopardy. Mr. President, are you suggesting, Mr. President, that this American, whoever he is, if tried in South Africa, he could expect something less than a fair trial? Something considerably less, yes, Mr. Pierce. I think he'd be prejudged and officially lynched. Now, uh, Mr. Webson, since you broached it originally, let me admit to you that in the short time allotted to me as president, I may never learn the subtleties of foreign relations, but uh, like you, several hundred years of history have made me an expert on lynching. Thank you, Mr. President. Say it all. How did I displease thee? Let me count the ways. <laughs> well, let me, Mr. President. You know, in 45 minutes, you managed to cast dispersion on the judicial system of a foreign country, pass judgment on several of their laws, and wound up tacitly accusing a United States senator of prejudice. Guilty, Mr. Talley, on all counts. <laughs> there comes a moment when you reach the bottom of the pit, you say to yourself, climb. It falls under the heading of belated pride. Well, you're not the first president to pop off at a press conference, but where did you get that clout? You came in with a rubber stamp and you walked out carrying a shillelagh. <laughs> when I was a kid, seven or eight years old, we used to have this little ditty we all used to chant. If I was the president of these United States, I'd live on lasses and candy and swing on all the gates. Well, what we swing on is a rope a few feet over the abyss it isn't lasses and candy, is it? It's either humble pie or bitter fruit. I've often wondered why anyone would want to be president. That's my only unique quality. I never wanted to be. It's also why I've come up so desperately short. I haven't served. I merely occupied the premises. Out of... Out of fear, Mr. Talley. Out of tension and panic, I made an assumption that I was a midget and couldn't reach the shelf. Well, I've been listening to Mr. Eaton and Senator Watson and my foreign policy advisor and the Speaker of the House and all the rest of these uh, illustrious statesmen. And I've discovered something. We're all midgets trying to reach the shelf. May I bring you something, sir? Oh, perhaps a straight razor, a chart of the human anatomy indicating the larger arteries. Stay alive for a while yet, Arthur. We need you. <laughs> Bourbon and water, please. I have been sitting here with our illustrious National Party chairman, wondering what happened to that erudite and dusky Mr. Chips this afternoon. He was as much of a surprise to me as he was to you. I, you know, I tell you, I tell you what disturbs me about his performance. 
<laughs> Not that he suddenly played at being president. But then he played at it so damn well. <laughs> See, I get, yes, I get this nightmare that at some juncture, as convention time draws nigh, Mr. Dillman is gonna get that traditional political itch. I can suffer this, this professor acting like a president, but the minute he starts acting like a candidate, we've either got to pull the rug from under him or else hang him by his old school tie. The assassination attempt on Wilhelm Vandeverk took place five weeks ago with the South Africans claiming that it was an American citizen who was responsible. To repeat the bulletin, the South African Republic has identified the American citizen accused as Robert Wheeler, a student from Dartmouth College. His whereabouts are at the moment unknown, but the South Africans have announced that if he returns to the United States, they will seek his extradition for the purpose of trying him in a South African court. In Oregon today, a spokesman... Did you know about this? Uh, I expect it's on my desk right now. Wait a minute, I better get over there. Thanks, Arthur. Arthur. Now, during your trips to the White House, in between the affairs of state, you give a thought to what you're going to do with yourself for the next four years. Maybe I figured this all wrong. We have been trying to muzzle this Mr. Dillman. Maybe we ought to let him loose, and then maybe, just maybe, he'll hang himself. <laughs> Mr. President. I hope this is as urgent as you say it is, Otis. I reached the point when I, if I drop a pencil and been down to pick it up, I'm two weeks behind. Uh, this young man is Robert Wheeler, Mr. President. The Robert Wheeler? Your fame precedes you, Mr. Wheeler. Won't you sit down? Thank you. When did you arrive? This morning in New York. I had heard you were a good friend of Reverend Waldron. I figured I'd be safe in his church for a while. Uh, sort of a sanctuary, Doug. A sanctuary. I hope you mentioned to Mr. Wheeler here, Otis, that... The concept of sanctuary was last heard from about the time of the Crusades. It's about as viable as the bubonic plague. I, uh, I explained to the young man that he couldn't stay at the church indefinitely. All right, Mr. Wheeler, fill me in. You're the only person on God's earth who can help me, Mr. President. Go on. Well, I'm going to be accused of trying to assassinate the South African defense minister. You're already accused, as of early this morning. The South African ambassador sent me an official brief. Your name is in it. I want to say this up front. If indeed I can help, there is a limit to it. And there is also a prerequisite. Very simply, you've got to tell me the truth. I'm not the one who threw that grenade. That I assume is provable. I was in Burundi. You can check that with the American consul there. I was in his office the day it happened. But not in the South African Republic. No, the week before. Doing what? Come on, Mr. Wheeler. I want every hole filled up here. There was an anti-apartheid parade. They took my name down. That's how they got it in the first place. Procedures as follows, Mr. Wheeler. I'll come back to the Justice Department and see about protective custody for you. Your family should be notified. You might tell them that if your story is verified, you're not in jeopardy. You won't be extradited to South Africa or anywhere else. Is that a personal guarantee, Mr. President? Let's just call it an unofficial presidential reassurance. Mrs. Bloor, get me Mr. Nelson, please. Thank you, sir. I could put him up in the rectory, Mr. President. You do that, Otis. You might fix up another bedroom in that rectory. When the South Africans hear that I've stuck my nose into this, I might need some sanctuary for myself, and I am running out of time. Very well. Have you ever met Vandervoort, Mr. President? No, I haven't had that dubious pleasure. Have you? When I was in the parade, the, a riot broke out. He had security police fire in the crowd. There were 12 people killed. Yes, I am not unaware of South African policy, but Mr. Vandervoort's bloody hands are not the issue here, Mr. Wheeler. What is at issue is your innocence. I have a few moments to answer questions before I have to get back to my office. If anybody has a Jordan, give me dictation. Hi, right, Don, take this. 
Press Secretary Stephen Helms just read a public statement issued by the President a few minutes ago. It's to the effect that Robert Wheeler, the American citizen currently accused of complicity in the attempted... What am I going too fast for? Complicity. C-O-M-P-L. Right. Complicity. Currently accused of complicity in the attempted assassination of the defense minister of the South African Republic is innocent of the charge. New paragraph. Uh, the president has directed the secretary of state to officially notify the consul general of the South African Republic that there will be no question of extradition of Wheeler because of the weight of evidence attesting to his five innocence. five bloody weeks tiptoeing around these South Africans, and twice now they have threatened to close down our embassy. They've been hit on a nerve with this thing, and they are not above breaking off diplomatic relations. Go on, Mr. Eaton. They're also not above confiscating American property. And should you not know it, Mr. President, they have more pride in that country than they do gross national product. And then this gets thrust at me. It's on the wires now. It's already been on television. The President of the United States is wearing three hats. He's the Federal Bureau of Investigation, he's the spokesman for the State Department, and he's assumed some sort of international judgeship. Mr. Eaton, I checked out my facts quite thoroughly before I issued that statement. The Wheeler boy wasn't in the South African Republic on the day of the attempted assassination. That was verified by our consul in Burundi. Well, I am delighted to hear it. But there are subtle and tactful and altogether diplomatic ways of allowing a foreign government to at least save part of its face. And you, Mr. President, have shaved them right to the bone on this. And as much as called them liars to the public. Which they are, are they not? Well, mistaken, maybe, but that's no reason oh, to take such a high hand. Come on, act. Mr. Eaton. You don't have to be diplomatic in here. We're talking about some white supremacist who deprived the black man of his human rights. I apologize for any embarrassment. But I don't apologize for what I thought was necessary to do and for what I did. Well, and it's a closed issue. I'll be seeing you tonight. The dinner party? No. Oh. Mrs. Eaton and I are looking forward to it. Jim? Right. Well, that should be a festive occasion tonight. Yes, a little like an Israeli picnic attended by Jordanian guerrillas. Yes? Mr. President, your daughter is here. I told her to send her in. Thank you. Well, I promise you it won't be dull. On my left, my daughter's a militant all the way over to Mrs. Arthur Eaton, who I understand is slightly to the right of Louis XIV. Well, I'll be the buffer. When the talk becomes political, I'll detour the discussion to American Beauty Roses. You do that for me. Mr. President, I know the convention's coming up. It's still a dice game. No one has nailed it down yet. Well, I understand that Mr. Eaton has... Well, it's nine weeks away. Now, if you were to decide to run for office, I know a lot of people who would support you. Also, there are quite a few around among your own cabinet. We'd like to find you in a motel on a Sunday morning with the village bimbo. They probably would hire their own photographers. Your point? My point, Mr. President, is the Wheeler thing. Now, why take on an albatross? You've got enough on your back to cripple you. He's innocent, Jim, and as pedantic and pompous as it may sound, there is a question of principles. Principles? Have some tea. Oh, well, thank you. Yes, principles. It's a delicious word, Mr. President. It price you right out of politics. The Dillman who's on her way here has a thing about principles, so don't mention compromise to her. She'll run you right out of the building. Well, since I'm opening up my veins, let me add this. I know a lot of men who have an itch to be president. Most of them couldn't qualify to get into the building on a bus tour. Now, I think you can prove yourself the exception if you sidestep a couple of times just to give yourself the chance. Only because I happen to think you're a hell of a guy. I'd best take that with me, Mr. Talley. After tonight, it may be the last tribute I get. Oh, Mr. Talley, my daughter Wanda. How do you do? Nice to meet you. I've heard a lot of things about you. Oh, yeah. Now you look more like a president. It's the suit. I now have a clothing allowance. <laughs> How are you then? Tolerable. Wow. This 
it is quite a pad. Are you comfortable here? <laughs> well, it's spacious, well lighted, plenty of hot water, good neighborhood. Before you take your shoes off, old girl, and start raising your stridently militant voice on all the issues, just keep in mind, we're only subletting the place. <laughs> In college somewhere in Ohio. I'm in graduate school at Oberlin. Oh, really? Are you uh, majoring in music? No, philosophy. Philosophy? Are you going to follow in the footsteps of your father and become a professor? I had in mind politics. Politics? Oh, my God. Another Dillman. <laughs> the country seems to be surviving with one Dillman. Oh, my dear. I'm I'm sorry, I didn't mean that to sound as harsh as it came out. Uh, well, I, I propose a toast to your father. Very oh, much in order, order. Mr. President. <clears throat> May the rest of the course be smooth and uneventful. <laughs> There's been a suggestion made that my father seek the nomination. Indeed. Uh, I wouldn't pay too much attention to Washington rumors, my dear. This town is the national headquarters not only for government, but also for gossip, which I disseminate too frequently, my husband tells me. <laughs> yes. Now, since this is the first social dinner in some time, I suggest that we forget all about politics. Really, I think, uh, I think you should count your blessings, Miss Tillman. Oh? Would you like to list them for me? Uh, Arthur, what's the new Chinese ambassador like? I'm told he's an extremely young man. Well, the inscrutable East, well, who first can and tell? Foremost, I mean, tell. Speaking of blessings, is the fortunate fact that your father is really more <coughs> an interim caretaker than president. I think that should be a cause for Thanksgiving. <laughs> uh, I'd like very much to propose a toast now to the president of the United States, to his good health. Here, here. Yeah. And to the Secretary of State, Arthur Eden Moore. Perhaps the next president of the United States. <laughs> you don't like the toast, Miss Tillman, or you don't like the brandy? Neither one. Well, speak your mind, child. I usually do. And of course, my husband tells me I make too many judgments. <laughs> that comes from having a father who was a senator. And a grandfather who's on the Supreme Court. Oh, I remember your father, Kay. I think it was 37 or 38. I remember he cornered Sam Rayburn. Oh, Charlie, Charlie! <laughs> Let's not turn this into a class reunion. Let's hear what Miss Dillman has to say about things. Like what things, Mrs. Eden? Genealogy? Well, my father was a school teacher, and his father sold catfish in Baltimore. <laughs> How interesting. Isn't it? And I'm sure if we ever figure out a family coat of arms, it will be a crossed pick and shovel over a cotton gin. Oh! Oh, no. Oh, Dillman, don't be angry. <laughs> then stop shaking your family tree at me, Mrs. Eaton. That's about as relevant as what Calvin Coolidge had for breakfast. <coughs> Mr. Telly, what happened to the American Beauty Roses? I got to warn them. What are we going to see, sir? Well, a film that was developed the day before yesterday, taken by an amateur photographer. A film of what, Mr. Ambassador? A murderer in the act of a killing. Defense Minister Vanderbilt died two hours ago of peritonitis. Now, look at that face. We have this senator, and we have a dossier on several bank activists, one of which very clearly implicates the man you've just seen. We have his sworn statement to that effect. 
taken us almost five weeks to compile all this evidence. Have you got a cigar? Oh, of course. Has this uh, film been shown to our Justice Department? Well, we only received it earlier this morning, Senator. Should have been sent there, and it should have been brought to the attention of our Department of State and, uh, and the President. The President? Mr. Dillman? <laughs> that would be a fruitless exercise, Senator. My government will request the extradition of this man. He happens to be black. And Mr. Dillman, uh, for your information, is also black. You noticed that, did you? Why did you uh, show this film to me? Well, you're a man of considerable influence in American politics, Senator. Your views on segregation are not unlike our own. Of course, in my country, we'd never have a black man as the executive of government. Well, 25 years ago, I could have said the same thing about the United States of America. It's proving very little, except that Good ideas are not immortal. They die just like men. Oh, no, no. The separation of the races is an idea that's going to die very hard. Oh, it's already died. You know how I know? I know because I'm going to walk out of here and strike a very damaging blow on behalf of white supremacy. Now, there was a time that I could have done that with a very great sense of accomplishment. But now I do it with kind of sick reluctance, holding my nose as I do. Arthur, I'm sorry to wake you up, but this is urgent. I have a film in my possession, which I'm going to send over to you by diplomatic pouch. Can you get copies of it made as soon as possible and send one of them to the Internal Securities Committee? And meantime, I'll put out some subpoenas. And then, Arthur, we're going to watch Douglas Dillman either backtrack or choke. And either way, we're going to burn the living hell out of him. Can you fit it in? Maybe I can squeeze it in. Between the budget directors and board and the minutes to the senior meeting. That's an oh. Not as young as you used to be, huh? Oh, tell me about it. <laughs> Do you know? I think this is the first time in about. Three years we've had time together? Much too long. <sighs> Tell me, did I embarrass you last night? Irreverent, disrespectful, painfully blunt. <laughs> I saw Arthur Eaton go over to you after a dinner and apologize. He was trying to salvage something out of the ruins. You accepted his apologies? What did you have, Wendell? A 6 a.m. duel on the East Lawn? No, maybe just a spit in the eye and a memo about super aggressive wives with pretensions to the White House. It's just not my nature, Wanda. I know. You're a very honorable man. A gentle, unruffable academician. Much scholarship, but mighty little passion. My back can get up every now and then. I only wish more frequently. You know, I like it when you lose your cool. Get up on your feet and go after somebody with your bare hands. Toussaint leading a black army, Nat Turner with a cutlass in his hand. Huh? Well, it's better than Booker T. Washington in the back of the lab with a test tube in one hand and a tossed bone in the other. Except that if I thought you were a lightweight, ineffectual klutz, I'd probably leave you alone. Well, may I assume I am not a lightweight, ineffectual klutz? <laughs> My father sold catfish in Baltimore, but his son, no fisherman. That's because all the fish are intimidated by the President of the United States trying to catch them. You want it on the telephone, sir? You've got to be kidding. It's a job. Got to make a living.
Delman. Oh, that you, Jim? Well, there's an excuse for me being up at 6.45. I'm fishing. Hey! Look at this. Minimum four pounds. Now, he wasn't intimidated when he found out the president... Trouble? We'll have ourselves brunch here, Wanda, but then I have to get back to Washington. Trouble. Yes, I'm his counsel. That's correct. Can you tell me why he's been asked to appear in front no. of the committee? No, I have no idea. Well, you must have some idea. No Come on, comment. give us some information. Oh, you you us some some information. Trying to get us for the price. Come on, give us some information. No, What's the matter with this? No comment right now. Thank you. No comment. No photographers, please. No photographers only. Authorized press without cameras. Marshal, close the door. We'll have to hold up about 15 minutes, sir. Uh, Senator Watson's at the White House. I'm sorry to have kept you waiting, Senator, but thank you for coming. Sit down, please. I hope we can make this brief, Mr. President. I see no reason why not. I'll throw you a couple of questions. You can give me a couple of straight and responsive answers. First, this afternoon's hearings of the Senate Internal Security Committee, of which you are a member. Yeah, that schedule will begin in about 15 minutes. For what purpose? Well, uh, it would appear to be obvious, sir. If it were obvious, Senator, we wouldn't be suffering each other at this moment. Now, I have a film in my possession which I intend to show at the hearings. I also have an affidavit from the American consul in Burundi, attesting to the fact that the man who came into his office was not Wheeler. His identifying passport was forged. Well, you have done your homework, haven't you, Senator? I have to. You don't see anything uh, conspiratorial in all this, Mr. President? I mean, a man attempted an assassination of the head of state and another man covering for him. I mean, you figure this is some kind of youthful, collegiate, oh, spring frolic, is that it? Well, let me assure you, Mr. President, that this was a planned killing. And if that young man was in any way implicated in what is now a murder, it's my duty to see that he gets burned. But you had this film in your possession as of uh, Thursday evening of last week, and if I'm not mistaken, Secretary of State Eaton is also privy to it. Now, isn't it odd, Senator, that no one found it fit to acquaint me with its existence? It's a little devious politics, Mr. President. I'll admit to that, but you, I don't know, you put it in a category like uh, burning a cross on the lawn. <laughs> well, that's not the case. See, the only thing that I'm trying to do, sir, is to put a, a price tag on that chair that you're sitting in so that special men will have to bid pretty high to be sitting there. Special men, Senator? Special men who would plot and manipulate and dig up bones after dark? Is that what you recruit for the presidency? In alleys and tunnels and subterranean crypts? That's not where you find presidents, Senator Watson. That's where you find night crawlers. Mr. Talley, will you show the Senator to the door? I know the way, Mr. President. Thank you. For whatever it's worth, Mr. President, they may have come into the White House through the back door, but they're trying to get in through the plumbing. Will they make it? Ever done themselves that much damage? Sure as hell have, sir. As simple as that. As simple and as ugly. I believed him to be innocent. Or did I just want him that way? Come to water again, please. Water, please. Ladies and gentlemen, please come to water. Stop talking, ladies and gentlemen. Now, now, Watson was in the middle of some questions. As I was in the middle of my questioning of uh, Mr. Wheeler, I believe. Now, Mr. Wheeler, I'd like to... Mr. Wheeler, I'd like to... 
to ask you for perhaps the 15th time. When you left the United States, did you or did you not have some blueprint, some plan to do bodily harm to the I victim? I refuse to answer that question on the grounds that it may incriminate me. Incriminate you, sir? Uh, you heard me, sir. Well, what if I would ask you the name of your accomplice? The man that you sent into our consul in Burundi Senator. to establish an alibi. Senator. Would you yes, sir. Those are inadmissible questions in a court of law. All right, I'll strike the adjective. And I'll simply ask you this. Who is the man? And does this man here know him? I'd just like to know Senator. the name of that man and what he was doing there. Senator, my, yes, client, my client chooses to invoke the Fifth Amendment. <laughs> then this question. Do people like you think that assassination is a legitimate political weapon? Do you believe in government by assassination? Now, don't give me any of that constitutional sidestepping. If you had guts enough to defend that act... You got guts enough to take your immunity outside and make those charges? Mr. Chairman, uh, we have seen one question, what... You have to answer them all. Now, remember that. I refuse to answer that question on the grounds that it may incriminate me. Very good. Now, Mr. Chairman, we have seen what appears to be a very incriminating film, and we also have an affidavit from our consul in Burundi attesting to the fact that the man who came into his office was not this man. Now, he, our consul, was shown photographs of the witness. If need be, this consul can be subpoenaed here in some, sometime in the future. But now, the whole thing, Mr. Chairman, in my view, takes on the dimension of a conspiracy. And I'd like the uh, uh, transcripts of this entire hearing sent over to the Justice Department immediately, immediately, for any further actions that they deem proper and necessary, and that's all that I have to say. Yeah. In just a few short weeks, and in this room, will occur America's quadrennial pastime, the political convention. The tomfoolery, the histrionics, the organized mayhem, but behind it all, the deadly serious business of a presidential nomination. And the most serious question mark that remains to hover over this convention will be Douglas Dillman, who just a few months ago was a political unknown swept up incredibly into the highest office of the land by circumstances as unpredictable as they were seemingly impossible. Much like his predecessors, he has inherited deadly damaging issues that somehow cling to him like personal albatross. Some presidents before him have had to face not dissimilar problems, from Teapot Dome to Vicuna Coates to Red Herring. Each has had to face his own special crisis. And in the case of Douglas Dillman, his special crisis is a man named Wheeler, whose possible extradition back to South Africa has ripped this country apart. And so at this moment, just two weeks before a new chapter in history, the question is whether Douglas Dillman can seek and expect nomination, and thus win something that up to now he has only borrowed without mandate. President, you represent this man? That's correct, sir. As a matter of fact, I requested the appointment because I knew of your interest in the case and your sympathy. Well, I wouldn't equate the two, counsel. I caught your client's matinee performance in front of the committee. The president, he invoked the Fifth Amendment this morning upon my recommendation. He doesn't have to invoke it here now. Any further self-incrimination would be damned superfluous. Hey, man, which side are you on, sir? All right, please. Do I have a choice, Mr. Wheeler? I believed you were innocent. I issued no fewer than three statements to that effect. I stood before a press conference and played Zola to your make-believe Dreyfus. And here we are today, young Mr. Wheeler, the liar and the dupe. And if I told you the truth, what kind of help could I have expected? Would you keep quiet? Well, that, Mr. Wheeler, is expedient desperation, but it's a long country mile away from a defense. Mr. President, what I came here this morning to discuss was some possible precedents. Forget it, Rob. Some recommendations for clemency. Forget it. He's no different from that freaked out Charlie Blue Eyes Senator Watson. You call it. And at least I read about this house nigger. Shut up, for God's sake. I killed a butcher, a lyncher. And I did it because he didn't deserve to live. He didn't deserve to live? And that is the epitaph that you personally carve on the stone? With my own two hands. And with pride. And with the same kind of passion you should have. With your own two hands. Mr. Wheeler, without a doubt. With pride, no, that would seem to be the case. But as for passion, Mr. Wheeler, 
Even a house nigger understands all about passion. Black men don't burn crosses. They don't plant a bomb in a church and kill four children. They don't geld innocent little sharecroppers. They don't hunt down a Martin Luther King and shoot him with a telescopic sight. That is cool stuff, Mr. Wheeler. That is bloodless. That is a master plan that comes out of a convocation of lizards. Passion may drive you into the streets to throw bricks or to fire a building or to snipe from a roof. All that is ugly, Mr. Wheeler, but that is passion. But to buy a gun and travel 5,000 miles to seek out a victim, to falsify a passport, to plant an alibi, and then to kill a human being and come back here and feel persecuted because a black man in a high place refuses to accept the politics of a corpse as a measure of your innocence. Don't you call that passion, Mr. Wheeler. You call that what it is. It's arrogance and ignorance. And the kind of a selective morality you'd expect from Adolf Eichmann. Mr. President, all we ask is time. That he be held on a charge here. Forget falsifying it. passports. Contempt of Congress. Forget Will it. Will you keep quiet? Maybe there's a section of the Forget it! My president be intellectual. You want to know something? I blew it, honest to God. I know that now. I got the wrong number. You want to know something else? I think you are the enemy. Mr. Wheeler, if I am the enemy, what happens? Do you kill me next? Is there a Robert Wheeler waiting for me? Or for my successor? Or for a Supreme Court justice who displeases you? Or the chief of police of Chicago? My God, man. When the smoke clears away and the bleeding stops, what have you got? You've killed and they've killed. You can't distinguish the enemy. Mr. President, maybe there was no more. But if we... him sent back I am at this moment desperately trying to think of a reason I should make an attempt to stop it where on earth did I ever get the idea that you were honorable you really must have conned me with your soft voice and your metaphors not honorable scared a privileged black man paying off and not having to live in the ghetto the house nigger right right on how the hell do you get out of the first family anyway? Do you just resign or what? You just pick an exit and walk, if that's what you want. That's what I want. Candidacy. He carries away 30% of your support on that convention floor in his pocket. They're mostly conservatives and middle of the road. Yes, I'm given to understand that. Well, please understand this, sir. We don't want you to saddle yourself with an uphill fight. Eaton is articulate, tough, and very shrewd. And he knows what he wants. And there are people behind him equally tough and equally shrewd. Like Senator Watson, eh? Great. He brings in Dixie, half the border states, and a sizable portion of the Midwest. Unless we hit them hard now, Eaton and Watson will wind up in control of the party. And that will represent one giant step backward to the last century as far as we're concerned. Doug, we've been in caucus with 23 black legislators and five times as many whites. Now, and they've all got good, solid pipelines to their convention delegates. And they want to climb on the wagon, Mr. President. Yours. But before they do, they want at least one half of a fair fighting chance. What we suggest you do now, Mr. President, is take inventory of your assets and liabilities. Assets you know. Liabilities you've got to shed like an overcoat. A particular liability named Robert Wheeler. We want Robert Wheeler passed over to another arm of government at least 10 city blocks from where you are. Any association with him will uh, kill you on that convention floor. 
We're suggesting, Mr. President, that you issue a public statement to the effect that you are turning the case over to the Justice Department or the State Department and washing your hands of it. Anything else that you have? Senator Miller, turning it over to any department, I'd be assured that they would do what is politically expedient, but I'm not certain they'd do what is morally right. Ralph, this isn't an issue we can sidestep. But he lied to you. We're not supposed no, to know he's he's sidestep any no, 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 I ran for alderman in Chicago when the highest salaried black man in Cook County was a janitor on pension. Now, would you please give me the benefit of some prior knowledge in the way of American politics? This is arithmetic we're talking about. With that Wheeler issue stuck to your hide, you're dead. Without it, you've got a chance. gentlemen have a mimeo sheet that was handed you when you came in rather than repeat what you've already read I'll simply tell you the sense of it and that is that I believe it is imperative that Mr. Robert Wheeler be extradited to the South African Republic to be tried for the assassination of their defense minister now I won't entertain any questions relative to this position I will however add the following we live in a time when violence is offered up as the panacea. The bullet seems to be the final instrument of political discourse. Men die violently, we bury them, we mourn for them, and we seek retribution. It's a deadly pattern. From Abraham Lincoln, to McKinley, to John F. Kennedy, to Robert Kennedy, to Medgar Evers, to Martin Luther King, the list grows. Violence, burial, and retribution. It simply must not go on. It can't go on. On the tombstone of one of these slain good men is a quote from Genesis. Behold the dreamer. Come now, therefore, and let us slay him, and we shall see what has become of his dream. We cannot murder the tyranny by murdering the tyrant, and we cannot murder the dream by murdering the dreamer. And if we justify the taking of any life in the name of our morality, we've done nothing but murder our morality. And that, gentlemen, is all I have to say. Mr. President, the consensus, Mr. President, the consensus, Mr. President, is that the country is split down the middle on the Wheeler issue. Now, you had an option, Mr. President, to take neither side. And yet, by sending Robert Wheeler back to South Africa, you have very definitely taken a side. Now, are we to understand that, that you will not seek the nomination? On the contrary, Mr. Pierce. I plan to fight like hell for the nomination. And that's what I intend to tell that convention out there. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen of the convention, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen of the convention, the President of the United States.
sure. It's different. Really. Most antiperspirant sprays go on wet and oily compared to sure, which goes on dry. And sure keeps you dry. Prove it under your own two arms. Try sure on your left side and the spray you like best on your right side. If you like most people, your left side will convince your right side. You'll be drier, we're sure.